Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Fleeting Thoughts, an altered TCG podcast, part of the Main Deck Podcast family. I'm Dan. And I'm Jordan. And today we're going to be going over some of the details that they released in their announcement for the official play circuit and details around that, including the LGS and the bigger events that they're planning on hosting. What do you think? Oh, I was going to say, what do you think about that, Dan? What do I what do I think about that? Uh, Organized play, as we like to call it, is a critical critical component of TCGs. It's the the getting the LGS involved. It's getting the player involved. Uh, it's 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 one of those. It's good for everybody, um, and importantly for to me, it, the TCGs. If I wanted, look, Jordan. If I just wanted to play a game, I you know I could always I can hop on my computer. I can grab a switch. I can play anything. I always play a game. It's not hard to have access to some kind of a, a game to play, right? But the reason I love TCGs is because I want to get in a room with a bunch of other people who really like the TCG, and I just want to geek out about it for like four days straight. That is super fun to me. I love the social aspect. I love meeting people. I love I love enjoying the experience, the hobby, the game with other people. So organized play, oof, critical, critical component. So yeah, I've, I've been really looking forward to talking about some of their teasers for the organized play program. True. But before and we get Jordan... In- Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, before we get into that, I know you have a couple words from our sponsors to go through. Oh, yes, yes. (laughs) Sure. Our sponsors who are, uh, well, it's actually you guys. (laughs) Um, uh, As I always say in every episode, if you enjoy the Main Deck Family podcast, if you enjoy Fleeting Thoughts, you enjoy listening to this, um, you can always support us by the super easy freeway, leaving a like, a comment, subscribing to the channel, all that stuff, giving us a five-star rating on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to us. Uh, that is all super appreciated and helps us grow and be found and, and all that kind of stuff. And then if you play any other TCGs, a an excellent way that you can support us is when you do any shopping for your TCGs, if you happen to shop on TCG Player for our American audience, especially, you can use our affiliate link instead of just going to the website. Uh, you can, to get there, you just type bit.ly slash shop TCGs. That's bit.ly slash shop TCGs. Then when you shop for your cards, we just get a little kickback, which is super, super appreciated. So thank you all for your support in every way that you support us. Um. So Jordan, we're going to have some organized play discussion here. And then, of course, we this has been excellent, but we've been getting a lot of great mailbag questions, too. So I think a chunk of the episode towards the end will be answering some more wonderful mailbag questions. And spoiler alert, we're going to answer a question right away from the one and only Gavken or Gavkenny, who uh, is we, we're infamous for stiffing on the questions <laughs> in the past. We're going to make sure we get his right away today. I'm super excited to answer that again he's got like he's got a fast pass to getting his question <laughs> answered now um but yeah yeah before that jordan what um let's okay so let's let's talk first of all let's explain to everybody what you know wh- where is this information coming from um what happened why do we have some information about organized play now what's what's going on jordan T- tell me i'm confused tell me uh, yeah, so I can't remember the exact date. It was a few days ago, um, yeah. maybe a, maybe a, a week ago. Um, time, time is an illusion at this point. <laughs> I know, right? Especially since I had like a lot of stuff going on this last weekend. But they did an announcement. A it was I'm not sure if it was it streamed live or was it just recorded and then posted. I couldn't exactly remember. I just remember getting an email after it had happened <laughs> and like checking the email and then watching the. It was it was a live stream. It was Equinox. It was it was Eric Julengod from Equinox was doing a live stream uh, talking about the OP program and then answering questions. Yeah. So I I previewed over the 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 VOD after the fact. Uh, Like I said, I I didn't realize it until I got the the email message about it because I was busy. But uh, I proved that and I'm excited about stuff. And they answered some other questions as well. that are related to OP, if you will, but not quite exact. Uh, but I'm I'm real excited to talk about it because they have some interesting stuff. And and in classic altered fashion, they're kind of revolutionizing the TCG space in a lot of ways. I, I was going to say something else and my brain just cut out. 
<laughs> anyway, uh, they're just kind too of. revolutionary. It's blowing my think, mind already as I, I'm talking about it. <laughs> I think I know what you're talking about in particular, and it'll be interesting to talk about because it's like it is it is kind of unique, but it's also not dissimilar to some other things. It, we'll, we'll, I think we'll be yeah. doing a little compare and contrast, and that'll be kind of it, fun to talk. If about. you're into games, it'll be a familiar thing, but this will be the first time I've seen it in a like real life paper game that I know of anyway. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And, and that does, that does make sense because altered has uniquely this big digital app integrated app where you need the app to play and it, and your collection is digital. And this allows some, it allows some unique things to be done. Um, so let's see where, where do we start with this, Jordan? There's, I mean, there's, I'd say there are a, f- a couple of tent pole, you know, topics in here. Um, and, and I would say though, the important things that, that really are the main focus of this are the OP roadmap. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to be saying OP a lot, which sometimes people think means overpowered, but I mean, organized play. I just want to be really clear about that. So we don't alienate anybody, um, organized play roadmap, uh, which is just going to be like a kind of how they're doing tournaments and, and the schedule for everything. Um, and they, and that has some information that's kind of broken into what, our weekly events like what are the bigger events like so we'll talk a little bit about that as well um and then we'll talk about some of the like organized play like prizing that they are they are teasing already um and in particular then we're going to get to the the adventure pass section and those i think are those are like the major things there are a few little questions answered in the in the thing as well which i'm sure we'll talk about um but jordan why don't you why don't you kick us off with the op roadmap what are we what what does an altered player when when altered finally launches um oh that was a sorry news thing there was a slight delay two week delay to the retail release of altered which i meant to mention right away um so altered is now releasing in early or mid september september 14th or something like that i believe i should i guess 17th i think i should have it in front of me and and i'm failing you all um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> by not ha- by just guessing at dates in the podcast um for for 13 13th it's friday it should be a friday i think right the seventh okay whatever i'll pull it up in a second the point is it was uh delayed two weeks so um that's only for the retail release so that is not affecting the kickstarter currently as uh Correct. as they've announced it yeah uh so anyway when Altered finally releases Jordan, what can people expect to see with regards to how they can play the game with others? Yes, yeah, so uh, there's going to be, I guess for lack of a better term, I'll say to start, to kick everything off, there'll be a pre-release tournament, or I, they use the word tournament here, but it's more just like a, like you said, like people gathering around and playing. I feel like it's going to be a lot more of a cash attitude as for a lot of people, it'll be the first time they're exposed to it. But at Gen Con, they're going to have a, uh, you know, a tournament where you use starter decks. And they also didn't confirm anything specific, but they also mentioned that the Kickstarter backers should have their product before then. And they may have something else for, you know, maybe some sort of like the first constructed event um, at Gen Con. They didn't say yes or no to it. They just kind of alluded to the fact that there will be people out there that have cards and they may do something else because they want to have more than just one main event. They um, they they did talk about that a little bit. Um, if I may, and unless I'm remembering wrong, Eric said that uh, at Gen Con there they have actually they have the space already laid out because they that has to be done for Gen Con well in advance. Um, and they're going to have a 64 player space in the in the game hall, basically. And in that space, they plan to run starter deck events. And uh, they also plan to run draft. Um, so there is nothing noted currently for constructed. Um, and that does make sense to a degree because the constructed will be very limited to whoever got their Kickstarter product. And there's inevitably, you know, there's going to be some potential like shipping issues or whatever. Um, and people might have it for varying lengths of time. And when it's when, you know, like if some people just got theirs like right before they left for Gen Con and other people got theirs two weeks ago, um, when it's when it's that close to the event, that can also be sort of like a you know maybe maybe an unfair advantage if there's anything really juicy on the line for prizes or whatever. So I could I could see them deciding not to do uh, not to add anything to that schedule that is constructed play. But I will tell everyone that if I have got my product in time, 
I will have constructed decks with me. And if we have time, I'm absolutely down to game. It'll be super, super fun. Uh, but yeah, like I was yeah. excited at least to your draft. Um, Dependent. Uh, they say a lot here. They say a lot in this whole um, in this whole OP sort of structure that they really want to key in on souvenirs. They want people to yes. go to an event and come out with swag. You want to come out with like, yeah, like I got my cool stuff that shows that I was at this event. It makes it feel special. It makes it feel like it's a destination that you want to get to. And when you see other people with that, with those souvenirs, like, oh man, like, like they even talk about, like, they talk about like hoodies and stuff. Like they see someone with that, like, I wish I had gone to that because you got that cool world's hoodie or whatever, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm I think they're planning. Yeah, I think they're planning stuff like that for Gen Con. So it'll what I play in will depend a little bit on like, you know, what what do I have to play in to get the really cool stuff, <laughs> I guess. For sure, for sure. But yeah, I think that's also why they didn't like say there was going to be a constructed event. They just mentioned that people would and then maybe they'll have it like last minute be like, oh, we'll run maybe probably like realistically if they did have some constructed, it'd probably just be like casual pods. Yeah, like they just I'd, be like, I'd say if, if enough people sign up for it, maybe we'll have something. And then, you know, but I wouldn't count on it either. Uh, the, the main draw is going to be the starter deck uh, mini tournaments and the uh, the draft. And I'm really excited to do the draft because based on what you told me about the draft, it sounds sick and I'm excited to try it for the first time at Gen Con. Yeah, that, oh, that'll be awesome. That'll be great. Um, so just for people's expectations at Gen Con, I would I would currently expect draft and starter deck. I would not expect constructed, but if they did slip something in there, it's probably, I agree with Jordan, it's probably on a casual level and it'll be you know, a little more last minute or something, or it'll just be like, here's some open tables like you can play or whatever. Yeah, they could do something like that if 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 they chose to. So, yeah. Um, and then um, so so how, oh, after Gen was, Con. Yep. So after Gen Con, once full release happens, you can expect uh, weekly events at any LG, any supporting LGS that is carrying the game and doing stuff. Uh, they will help the LGS as best as they can. If I remember correctly, they're going to give them nine packs a week to give out for an event so top eight is supposed to get a pack and then they give a ninth pack to give out however the store sees fit um there's no strict format they're kind of leaving everything in the lgs's hands which is really nice because that way the lgs can cater their you know events to whatever the people in that area want to play some people like more casual some people like more hardcore some people like weird off the wall like events sometimes they like sealed sometimes like draft so it really leaves the door open for them to just cater to whatever audience that they have in their area which is really nice i want to just jump in and say that i i looked it up so that we have the correct information september 13th is the official retail launch now so friday september 13th um so these weekly events should be starting up i i believe then uh at retail launch because that's what the the op roadmap notes that retail launch appears to be the start of weekly play so i think at uh, starting september 13th your lgs's will have and jordan said packs but really it's it's special promo packs it's not just yes. set one boosters um yeah, sorry I, I should have clarified that they're 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 like uh that's okay that's three card promo packs that have a chance to have the full arts of some of the characters there's potential alternate art cards for tokens. And then, of course, you can get uh, rares or potentially uniques. Um, there's foilers that can potentially be pulled from this. Um, it also... Was there anything else? I feel like I'm missing another thing. No, they... they is that everything? That's, that's everything they have listed right now. And um, they, they say that the... Uh, Examples for wave two will be different in many ways. So this is this is just the wave one re season one rewards. Um, and season one is 2024. Yes. Correct? Yep. Yep. Season exactly. Two so season two is going to start with next year. Season two will start with the uh, with the next set, I believe, which is slated for January, um, yes, which leads us to the next bullet point in the to the roadmap, which is expansion one should roughly release again they don't have the exact date maybe there'll be delays but uh they're planning for january of 2025 um, yes and for for 2024 don't expect any huge events um it's basically going to be this weekly system but it's going to be more than just you get a pack at your local store with promos we'll go over that uh, a little bit more detail later there's also what they have they're calling the adventure pass that is for um I, it's more than just the weekly 
tournaments too, right? Like any bigger tournaments count for progression yeah. or is it just the weekly? Okay. No, so yeah, it'll it's, be, it's, it'll be progression no matter what type of event you go to. Um, but for the first the half year or not even half year, it's like three months. Um, it'll be just that. Basically, they just want to get more word out because as, as we've said in a previous podcast, we know this game's going to be big, but it still needs that time to kind of cultivate. And they probably don't want to spend too much time firing off big events when the game is still getting its name out there and getting players. So um, as much as I love going to big tournaments, I am glad they're taking their time with it because that way the event can really hit home and there'll be more people playing the game and actually you know going to it rather than having a lukewarm first big event because not a ton of people, you know, are, are on board yet. And I think uh, another thing about having your events start just a little bit later is that it gives you a little bit of time to figure out what your players are excited about and what they want to do. And just in general, having time to build out your infrastructure for organized play is really important so that when you tackle this event, you've, you know, you've, you've got your, your app that's tracking player stats all figured out and everything. And your tournament software has got no major bugs or anything like that. Um, and you are able to build in a robust reward system and everything at that point and have all that cool swag, all that cool, those cool souvenirs ready to go. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I, We've talked about this for some of the other games that have been coming out recently, and I tend to feel that um, I, you know, I kind of like when there are at least some like store championship level events uh, in set one. Like, I don't mind that, like a little bit of like the kind of level where it's like, yeah, I'll go to my locals and we're all going to get a little more competitive just for one day and just kind of see what happens. Uh, it sounds like that's something they're planning in the future, but they don't have it kind of codified right now. They don't have a a ground the groundwork really laid for that. Um, but when we get to set two for any game, I usually, I want to have, okay, it's like, it's time to travel. It's time to have a cool event to go to. Um, so I was really excited to see these on the schedule and ready to go What they're calling. They're currently calling them, uh, altered cons or confluences. Um, mm -hmm. and they said both of those are not necessarily the final name. Um, however, I think confluence is like an incredible, I think it's an awesome name. I hope they keep that honestly. Yeah, for sure. When I first uh, saw the slide and I saw altered cons before they said the word confluences, I was like, because some games will have like blah, blah, blah con and it's like an actual convention just for this. And I was like, damn, they're going to have four full conventions. <laughs> and then right. I was like, oh, never mind. It's like a um, if you had to uh, attach a normal TCG term to it, it's probably roughly going to be something like a regional or maybe national level, if you will, um, as far as like what your opening expectations should be uh, from the, the information we've been given anyway. However, I, think, I did. Oh, I was just going to say, I, did... I think, I think some games um, regionals are like one day events and this, these are meant to be two to three day events. So I, I would say they're a little bit bigger than that. Like for people who have played magic, the gathering grand prix is the common term for in magic for these open entry events that are multiple days and full of side events and stuff. Um, so I think it's I'd say it's like a, a step above what a lot of games regional is like. And it's more like a, a Yu-Gi-Oh, YCS, uh, Magic Grand Prix, uh, Grand Archive, Ascent, something like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and part of the reason I said it's in between is because they also um, said that they want them to be more than just you come and play in one tournament. Like, obviously, we like side events, but it sounds like they want more out of their side events as well. Like they've like you said, they're in for the destination uh, and the souvenirs, they want you to feel like you're getting uh, you know, more bang for your buck when you come to these events to really incentivize you to want to come. I don't think they gave any ultra specific things that were going to happen, but they alluded to having, you know, wacky fun side events. There's going to be the souvenirs that are going to be things that you're going to want to be part of that are most likely going to be exclusive to those events. I imagine they'll probably have a testing ground for, you know, new modes that they might want in the future or, you know, Basically, my 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 imagination's running wild on the different things they could do. Like they could do like testing grounds there, where they have random, uh, you know, cards that are being tested that they'll just put in the draft pool and stuff like that. And that could yeah, be you definitely you know, your imagination's really running wild here. <laughs> Holy cow! 
Because, I mean, they, it would be a good thing to do. It would create a, a memorable event that would also yeah. yield them more, like, in the field information with players to be like, hey, what did you think about all these test cards? And they could get some good feedback in addition to giving the, the you know, the attendee something that they couldn't have gotten elsewhere. In addition to all the stuff you'd expect, such as the main, you know, competitive event and stuff like that. Well, well, uh, I think I think Justin, the OP manager, knows how to reach out to us if he needs some ideas from you, Jordan. <laughs> you'll, you'll be full of great ones for him. Um, they do mention that they're doing some non-gaming things like uh, meet and greets, artists, cosplay contests. And then this is where they say free play and fun formats where Jordan gets all his hope from <laughs> this, I, inside, those is. couple of words that gave him already let his imagination run absolutely crazy but also um, they mentioned uh i don't think they mentioned specifically providing food but they said they wanted it to be like a you know big experience and they mentioned the word food a few times and i'm not oh, sure no, if that they just did. means yeah and i was like they I don't, I don't i don't remember if they gave any full details but i was like does this mean there's going to be like a big dinner or they're going to cater or something and <laughs> we're going to get some like altered theme like desserts or food because that would be sick you know okay. i love my food and desserts I, 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 I can chime in on this one a little bit. So Eric did mention at the end of the Q and a section, um, as they were talking more about it, he mentioned that f- like food was uh, an important thing for them. Good food is something they want to have, which I don't know if it's like, a, a if that's like a, like a French cultural thing or something. Cause like every American TCG, everyone's just like, yeah, whatever, like go get whatever. And they'll have it at a convention center with a bunch of overpriced food or something. But he has a, a very, very big focus on, no, no, no. If you're going to come to this thing, we're going to eat well, and it's not going to cost you a lot of money, uh, which I greatly, greatly appreciate. I think that's awesome. Um, and when I can say just when I was at the, it, when I went to Paris for the, for the event up there, um, they did bring in food for everybody the, the whole time. We, we had dinner and lunch there, and we had croissants which were incredible, by the way. It's <laughs> super, super good. Um, and they had a, a bar at the end of the day that had themed altered drinks as well. Um, I I had the, I think I had the Muna one a couple of times and it was quite good. <laughs> um, the Muna, maybe the, Iz- the Izmir. I didn't have the Axiom because it had like cinnamon in it and I wasn't, I wasn't feeling that, I feel like, or something like that. It had something, some spice or something. And I was like, I don't know if I want that right now. But anyway, um, yeah, so I, themed stuff is probably not off the table either, but um, it sounds like maybe at least they're going to be trying to find venues where the food is more reasonable to be able to buy or work with the venue or something to be able to set those up. Like when Jordan, when we went to Ascent Houston for Grand Archive, they had set up a little deal with the restaurant at the hotel there where you you paid an amount and got to go get a whole bunch of food. That was a pretty solid deal. And they had a VIP lounge for uh, people who paid for bigger tickets or whatever, who could get a bunch of free food that whole time, too. So um, we're starting to see some card game events cater food a little bit, uh, cater to food needs a little bit more, um, which is great. So, yeah, I, I didn't mean to talk all, all about food for <laughs> the OP program. No, man. But- it's 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 going to be if it's going to be part of it, that's an exciting thing, because, I mean, we can't be the only group of people, because if, if you want to know a little insider information about the main deck crew, when we travel to events, one of the things we're always excited about is what kind of cool restaurants can we go to when we're not competing? And like uh, it's, it's one of the joyous, joyous parts about traveling with the homies is finding great food locations. Uh, yeah. So it's my favorite that, uh, thing. The altered development team is on the same page with food as us makes me also very excited. Yes, super, super, super pumped about that. Um, so the there's one last, I think, a really important thing we have to say about the altered cons. So they're they're planning again one in uh, well, I didn't, we didn't mention this, but one in the USA and one in Europe um, in the in, in the entirety of season two. So there's only one in each location. So they're definitely like destination events. Um, to get to those. And then once they get to set set two or set three is going to launch, then they're again planning one in each NA and uh, America and Europe. And then in the following set, we're going to have worlds. And the thing is, when you go to the altered cons and you compete and you perform well enough, you are going to earn a qualification then to play in the worlds, what I assume is going to be the world's main event, but we don't have a lot of information about this. Um, I'm just going to throw out there, throw this energy out there that um, 
there is there is at least one card game recently, which is an extremely popular uh, Japanese card game, one of the big three, and it isn't Pokemon. So you can try and narrow it down at that point to which card game I'm talking about, who recently announced that their Worlds event is invite only and there's no side events there's no open entry events whatsoever so it's really just the invited players go to worlds and that's the end of it and to me that is the worst way to handle worlds um i think worlds in any card game should be an absolute celebration of the game every single player from the most competitive to the newest player should have a desire to go to worlds um and that's how that's just how you get that. I'm going to use that the term they're using for the other ones, that confluence of your player base who all get to get in the same place and share that energy and that passion and that joy of the game and the hobby. And and it's at the you know, and they get to watch the best players compete and they get to compete themselves and walk home with really cool souvenirs. So I I have no doubt. I have no doubt, given the team that they understand all of these uh, what I think are needs for worlds but we don't have information on it yet so we'll, we'll see yeah for sure um and like you said uh some of the tentative uh date timelines that they gave uh expansion 2 is coming out may 2025 assuming everything lines up correctly and then the confluences will be in middle of june slash may and middle of may slash august uh sometime in those time frames um am i reading it sorry I can't read. My eyes are dumb. I was just like, May isn't after June. Somewhere yeah. between June and July will be the I US was like confluence. listening here that I was like starting to try off like, <laughs> is Jordan OK? Like, yeah, I have the, I have like the graphics so I can reference it and it's slightly smaller. So like the L, Y and the like it with my bad eyesight, it looked like May from far away. With It's OK. We're text. TCG players. We don't read anything anyway. True. <laughs> But yeah, so it'll be about that time frame and expansion three is around September and sometime, you know, September onward, probably closer to the middle of September or October ish is probably when we're likely going to see worlds. But again, they didn't give any big information on worlds other than its existence and that it's maybe in Paris, but they didn't confirm that either. It seems it seems likely and I hope it is because I would I would love to go back. Yeah, it'd be pretty sick. I'd be excited. So I just got to get that qualification. That's right. That's right. Um, so, okay. That, I mean, that's, that's a lot about the, the sort of the higher level stuff. Now let's talk about this weekly play. We already talked about the promo boosters. I just want to mention one thing about the promo boosters quick, by the way, which is that um, I've been saying since uh, to reference just another one of the TCGs we cover again, since grand archive launch, they've been doing these event packs where you get uh, a couple of cards um, and they're usually rares or foils from the set, but they have a chance to be some exclusive stuff. Well, look at this. Altered is launching with some weekly packs that you can get promo boosters that have three cards per boosters that have a chance to be rares and uniques or foilers or alternate art cards. So this, I mean, this is, in my opinion, this is the optimal way to do this. It allows people to, especially the fact that there are uniques in here. I keep coming back to this. I keep coming back to this, but I really think it's going to be a weird psychological thing you see from people, which is that when uniques exist and there's a bunch of different types of products that can have uniques, I think players are going to look at different products and start to develop really weird, like uh, conspiratorial thoughts about them. Like, like the German packs have better uniques for Axiom or like the event packs, those have really good uniques in them or something like now, now that we have event packs, that can have uniques too. Like, I don't know. I just, I think, I think there's funny player psychology that a, that'll develop around those unique cards. Um, but I'm excited to open these boosters and be able to get, um, you know, get, get uniques right out of them or get foilers or get alternate art stuff. So that's going to be, that's going to be a lot of fun, but for sure. How about adventure Wait. pass? Jordan, what's yes. adventure pass? So adventure pass for, um, if you want the quick TLDR, uh, if you've played video games, uh, any, any video games in the past, like 10 years that are multiplayer, they have what are called a battle pass. They sure a lot do. Of them, and a lot of them aren't that great. And they try to milk you for money and time. This is kind of like that. If you took all the bad ideas out of it and just had good <laughs> ideas, uh, is basically what it is. They're, they're taking advantage of the fact that they have a physical game, uh, that has a lot of digital asset or like not assets, digital uh, features to it. 
Um, and they're kind of blending it together perfectly. So what will happen is since, you know, the LGS and the online system and their software will all be tracking when you play in events and your stats, stat tracking, all that good jazz, they're putting it to good use by having the Adventure Pass. The Adventure Pass also is free, which is one of the big reasons it's way better than most other that's, systems. That alone. That's what I mean. The rest almost doesn't matter. Like it's free and you get stuff. Cool. Good system. I like it. Yep. Uh, so what will happen is uh, if you aren't familiar with battle passes, generally you'll have some form of way to level up this pass by getting experience. And then each level you'll get some form of benefit or prize or reward. Uh, in Altered's case, every time you play an an event, you will gain a level. Um, and each level comes with some sort of, uh, you know, thing. For example, uh, I don't know if they said that these are locked in, but at level one, uh, you start there. Level two through four, you will get uh, three, I believe that's uncommon foilers. Those are common foilers. Eyes, or they're common. Sorry. Yep. Silver in my head is always uncommon. There's not even uncommon in this game, so I don't know why nope. I jumped to that. Yep. I, yeah, Jordan, Jordan actually doesn't play altered at all, everyone. I'm sorry. He's been faking <laughs> oh God, the whole time. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you'll get uh, three common foilers for those levels, and then you'll get an alternate art card at level five. At level six, you will get, I think that's a icon like a it's it'll another be like a yeah. banner so these, for your these icons profile. will appear on your profile on the app and but there's there's more we'll talk about that in a yes. sec you just finish your yeah, thing we'll, we'll get to that so then uh level three will be three or seven through nine will give you some rare foilers level 11 will upgrade your profile icon even further level 12 and 13 you'll get two unique foilers Level 14, you get the final alt art, which I believe will be the shifted, the color shifted rare version, if I'm not mistaken, of whatever that card, particular card is. And level 15, you'll get the final profile icon. Um, and oh, I just had another thought about it. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's OK, so you they're okay? tracked digitally. And then at the end of the season, yes. you will be given the rewards based on how high you got. Another cool note is when you start the season, um, each of these, the determination of what kind of alt art cards you get and such, you will fight for a specific faction. So you will choose one of the six factions to represent. This does not mean you have to play those factions in events. It's just all of your stats for that season will go towards a bank of that specific uh, faction. And the faction theme will be set for your alt art card. So if you're Axiom, you'll get Axiom alt art cards in the battle so, pass. So the alt art cards specifically, they're they're offering specifically spell and landmark alt art cards, so not characters. Um, and they said something about that having to do with characters have unique versions as well. And they weren't they it was it was too complicated for one reason or another to work the unique alt arts into the battle pass also. So the way they decided to do this is just do spell and landmarks because they only need two of uh, arts for each one. You unlock the Alt art of the common version at, as Jordan said, at level five. At level 10, you unlock the alt art of the rare version in faction. And then at level 14, you unlock the faction shifted alt art of that card. So it actually, so your first two, your common and your rare, will be the faction you chose. And then the other one, the final one, will be actually the, if you wanted to use that card in whichever faction it is out of faction in, you'll get the alt art for that. Um, these are also, so these are going to be digitally unlocked in your account and they are going to be treated the same as your normal digital unlocks, meaning that they will be tradable and sellable on the marketplace as well. And that when I, when I put that together too, I was like, wait, this is like, I mean, I know you can do that with card games already, but the fact that there only are going to exist a number of alt arts for that faction equal to the number of people who signed up to play in that faction and unlock them. That's all that mm -hmm. will exist on the marketplace. You can't buy more boosters and get more of these. There aren't like stashes of promo cards sitting in a warehouse, a bunch of LGSs who just didn't have, they just, yeah, this is going to be like, I think these are going to be really potentially, potentially a, a bit of a, a, uh, gold mine for people who are trying to trade for stuff or whatever. Like if you want to try and acquire all of them, you're going to be trading with other people to try and get their alternate art ones. And I think they're, I think they're going to actually potentially have a little bit of value to them, which is going to be really cool, I think, and a good incentive to play. 
Yes, and when I saw this feature as well, this shores up some of the, because as you guys may have heard in some of the other podcasts, I'm a little bit more hesitant on whether I think collectors would be truly on board with Altered because of, you know, the unique cards, being able to never complete a set, um, people being able to print off cards, but stuff like this are huge steps into I'm on board now thinking that if I was only collecting the game, this is a big chase thing for me. Like, I'm going to be out there looking for all of the different alt arts that I can get that are season specific because those are going to be more finite. And sure, people can print them, but owning them is going to be the real kicker. Like, if, like, like Dan said, if only four Axiom players ever make it to level 14, then there's only four copies of that alt art anywhere floating around in the marketplace. Like, that'll be the only way to get them. And it's going to be really cool. Um, I'm excited to get the ones that I want, but I'm also a little scared that the ones I'll want are going to be the ones that no one unlocks and they're going to be skyrocketed in price. But uh, at the end of the day, they're only alternate of art, so the competitive edge isn't there. Um, you don't have to worry about someone getting this bomb card that only exists in finite amounts. It's just a pretty card, which is always perfect for these kind of rewards because everyone likes cool-looking cards, and they don't have to worry if it's exclusive because it's not going to, you know, they're not going to lose a game because someone has a special card. Yeah, it's um, they did. There was a question towards the end where they were asking if there would be um, functionally unique cards that are given as promos, as digital promos. Um, and so this was an interesting answer. It, it sounds like they are still considering that as an option. Um if they go that route, I just hope that it's, you know, like I, I again, I have a lot of faith in this team. They come from a background of strong competitive card gameplay before. So I don't think we are looking at the kind of uh, the kind of situation where players will just enter a tournament, do well, get a card that beats everybody, and then they have that card and no one else does, you know, that kind of thing that we've seen in some other card games in the past. Um, but I'm I'm hoping they're they're thinking more like uh this season everyone who plays is going to get access to this cool card or something and and uh or maybe they're like maybe that's just for for play in specific formats or maybe it's you know i there's there's a lot of ways you can do that and make it interesting and fun without just breaking the balance of the game if they do decide to do this not something locked in either but they did say they're thinking about it yeah for sure um so we also we mentioned these these rank ups. You like you start with kind of like a bronze profile. You get a silver and a gold, and then some kind of like a diamondy looking one. Um, so one thing I thought was really interesting about this was the note that um, as you are leveling this up, and again it's it's fifteen events. I want to actually step back and just mention the the time frame for that. You have to play in fifteen events to max this out, um, and you have a four month season to do that because the season is basically from one set release to another. So there are going to be four month seasons. So if your LGS has a weekly altered event, you and just, even if you're, if you LGS has one weekly altered event, you attend that every week and you can miss one and you will have your battle pass maxed out. You'll get the full rewards. Um, if you your LGS has multiple events in a week, there is no limit to the amount of progressions you can get in a week. So let's say they have a draft night every other week, even or something. Well, suddenly, if you know if you attend some of those, you can be done even sooner with getting that battle pass. But it's kind of structured to make it so that they're encouraging people to just come on a weekly basis. And if you miss some, you can make it up by going to other events. Maybe you travel to go to Altered Con and you uh, I mean, there may be multiple events you play in at a confluence which would give you a tick each time potentially for each each tournament that you play in there you play in a, a draft and then you go and you play in some some funny format and then you play in the the main event and you know whatever like that could all add up pretty quickly too so um it seems like it's going to be not unreasonable at all for players to unlock these as long as they are you know they're just trying to attend and, and be there um and i i like that system quite a bit but as you rank up and you get these profile badges upgraded they mention that uh players are going to be at tournaments you're going to be matched with players who have similar profiles to yours that is that is that is a fascinating i mean it's not it's not weird really it's because if you if you break this down i, I said i was going to do some comparing and contrasting this whole thing to me is a very simplified version 
um, in a good way, in a good way, a simplified version of a sort of basic ELO, an ELO player reward system. Um, ELO is a concept that comes from chess uh, and some other games where players get a ranking. And as they play other people with higher rankings and they beat them, their ranking goes up. If they play other players and lose, their ranking is going to go down. But the ranking increase or decrease is based on the relative scores between the two players. So if you go against a chess grandmaster and you're a newbie and you lose, well, that was expected. So your ELO doesn't actually lose that much. But if you beat that chess grandmaster, you're going to get a big jump because like, wow, like obviously you deserve to be ranked higher. Um, so that's the that's the whole idea there. Uh, and so... This is kind of like if you had a system, um, I get, I, I'm sorry, I keep referencing it, but Grand Archive does a lot of these things too. <laughs> Grand Archive has a system um, it built in their Omnidex that's sort of a, a system that factors in ELO and then and then some other things, veterancy, the amount of events you played in your lifetime and the events you played in that season. And this is like a simplified version of that where it just says, okay, okay, don't worry about ELO. Don't worry about you know lifetime events or whatever, but just this season, how many events did you play in? doesn't even matter how you performed. Just how many events did you play in? We're going to give you rewards based on that. Um, but by doing this, they they sort of worked in this like ranking type system where if if you played in a bunch of events, you're going to get played play. You're going to play with other players who have also played a bunch of events that season, which isn't ever. It's not going to be like a direct match in skill level. Like Elo, after a long time, gets you to a pretty good place where it's like, yeah, I mean, like you should be at about the same skill level as someone else who's been playing for a long time, who has about the same ELO as you. Um, but this is going to be close enough, right? Where it's like, it, it's going to be interesting where like newer players will play against other newer players, typically. Um, veteran players will play against other veteran players, typically. Um, and if you if you don't play altered for a couple sets and then you come back, or, or just at the start of each set, really, you're just going to be paired, everyone's going to be starting fresh, you're going to be played against anybody, but then the more you play that season, the more you kind of like, shake the dust off, shake the rust off, whatever you're feeling a little stronger than you're going to be playing against people who also are feeling that way. So that's kind of interesting. Jordan, what do you think about, about matching people that way? Um, I think it's, uh, like I said, also quite interesting. Um, a few things that are like, what if they're like, what if someone tries to game it? But I feel like it, then it's just like every other card game. Cause even if someone like huffs it out in bronze, does one event. So their bronze and then goes to the confluence, I feel like since it is a card game, their skill still has to show through and maybe they'll get some favorable early matches and then they're quickly going to get jumped up to the people that are their level. And then their tiebreakers are just going to be worse because the people that they fought were probably genuinely new and don't have as great of a record versus the person who started in diamond, if you will, because then all their matches were with other diamond players that are probably going to have a better record than the person who just bought a starter deck and wanted to play in a confluence event. Yeah. So, okay. That's let's, let's dig into this. Cause this is actually, this is getting a little, a little bit um, in the weeds for, I'm sure some of our audience here, but so Jordan immediately jumped to competitive card gaming, which is, which I can appreciate too. Uh, and in competitive card gaming, we typically have, you know, in a tournament, you're going to be, the point of a tournament is to find out who is the best player. Um, and, when you're trying to rank people based on how good they are and you get people who have uh, the same score in the tournament, the next thing you go to is tiebreakers, which is typically going to look at something called a strength of schedule, which is basically saying of all the opponents you across your schedule that you played, how strong were they? Um, and the players who played who played stronger opponents are typically then going to have better tiebreakers because it means, well, even though we have the, Jordan and I have the same score, I played a bunch of new players and Jordan played a bunch of grandmasters. So Jordan, we have the same score, but his wins should be, you know, worth more if that makes sense. So his tiebreakers are better. So, um, and so I have to explain that. And then Jordan was kind of getting at the idea of smurfing, uh, which is something from, um, from esports. the idea that in, in competitive online video games, very good players, let's keep calling them grandmasters because it's simple. Like grandmaster players will, make accounts that are new sometimes so they are ranked bronze because then they go in and they start playing against other bronze players and they get to beat them very easily because they're grandmasters um, and the other players are not so jordan then was wondering if you could smurf the events using a system like this but i agree because i think that 
the tiebreakers will largely be a lot worse if you if and I, I what I think too I think we're we have to read into this and and I don't know if they're going to fully use the system but if they use something like this my assumption is the first way they pair people up is based on your your score at the tournament number one. It's like, it's your score hundred, like you're not just going to, that, that would be broken if they didn't do that. The only way they can do a tournament is if it's based on score first, but then when they're deciding where people get paired against each other, they're going to have to decide within the same score. Are they using tiebreakers for that tournament? Are they using ranking or, you know, some mix of those things in some way. And so I, you know, I think, I think that Jordan's right. If they do rank you with other bronze players more often that way, those bronze players are likely also going to not do as well in the tournament, potentially on on average, on average, um, and so the tiebreakers might be worse. So it might actively hurt you to do a, to try and like smurf events this way, I guess. Yeah, it also incentivizes you if you are a competitive player to attend more events to boost your you know up to your diamond rank um, or whatever they're actually. I think it's platinum, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe. But, um, to boost it up there because then you might have my my assumption is. They're just going to do it for the initial seeding. So for round one pairings, they'll probably use this as like the main metric because there's not a whole sure. lot to go off of unless, I mean, I guess they will have complete stat tracking. So maybe they will have some big robust algorithm I'm assuming they'll use for that. But they do like um, algorithms here. Yeah. So uh, they'll, the, it'll incentivize you as a competitive player to make sure you're at that level when it comes time for the big tournament, because then you'll have more favorable seeding. Sure, your matches will be tougher, but that strengthens uh, our, you know, our hypothetical idea of what their tiebreakers will be, which uh, makes you more engaged throughout the whole season. Um, but on a casual level, uh, jumping away from the competitive scene, I think it's great. Um, it's going to if it matches you with different rated people that are the same rating as you, it helps great. And it makes sure that everyone is going to have a good time, because if you're like us who are yes. going every single week, whether we're good at the game or not, we still have that table experience. We're dedicated to the game. We're going constantly, which means we probably, you know, have at least X amount of knowledge about the game versus, you know, someone who just picked up a starter deck and they know nothing about the game. If they get paired up, you know, against me or you, we're nice. We're probably going to make it a good experience for them. But there's a lot of people out there who are like, oh, easy win. I'm going to crush this person. And then one person has a terrible experience by no fault of their own, by just, you know, no fault of their opponent either because their opponent's there to play and win. Like you can't fault them for doing that. But in this case, they'll probably pair the new player up with another new player. They get to fumble around together and have a great time with the game and they both walk away having a great time. So I think it's a on the casual level, like the weekly level and stuff, it's going to be great. Um, I, yeah, I just I think it's a good idea uh, starting out. Maybe my tune will change after we deal with it for a while. But I feel like on paper, it seems like a really great idea and it helps all levels of play kind of fit into the bracket that they're going to want to be playing at anyway. Yeah, I, I agree, I, especially for the casual level. I think this is awesome. So I'm excited to see how it interacts with competitive play. But um we're already going to be we're, we're going to have lots of interesting things to chase at the competitive level since they're going to be pushing like faction based events like best in faction rewards at confluences and everything too. this. It's um, I'm excited to pick my faction. It's I assume it's going to be Muna at this point for season one. Um, That's a tough and, choice for me. That's what makes it so sad. I don't know which one. I'm, I'll wait to see what cool cards they have as the alt arts and I'll let that steer me because there's like at least three factions. They actually bravos is starting to grow on me more and more too so now there's I four know, that i'm like too. really like because i was originally just like all axiom and all uh, uh yzmir and then when i finally tried uh oh the name just threw away the harp pink jordan jordan doesn't know this game at all sorry i'm gonna get a new call for just, next episode guys i have my own Thanks. colloquial names for everything so lyra. i think of that in my name lyra <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I call them different stuff when I play them personally. So then when I have to think of the, the like actual names, I'm like, what is it again? Because it just keeps popping into my head of what they are. Um, Co but, uh, comment below if we should kick Jordan off and get a new co-host <laughs> in the next episode. <laughs> yeah, Bravos is uh, really growing on me now, too. And I'm like, oh, I, they're, they're starting to become a favorite as well. So I'm just having to pick between them. It's OK. It's OK. We'll we'll find a way. You'll make it. You'll You'll get through. <laughs> I'll just right. make four accounts and play four games at once. Whoa, I don't know if that's legal. 
I'll have a dollar. Uh, that's four only, shots that's that interesting I go though. To. That's interesting though. Like I wonder I wonder if that's something what what kind of if that's something they're gonna be fine with if people like let's say someone just plays over five weeks, they just jam a ton of events and they just start a new account and start a new uh you could I don't see why you couldn't um just like physically speaking, start a new account and play on that account and then just send over the the alt art cards to your main account. So I wonder I wonder what they're gonna do about that. If that's kosher or I don't know. I don't know. That's My assumption is they game. probably have like uh timers on certain copies being like traded or like purchased. Like you can't like trade back and forth the same like four copies more you know x times hmm. in a small time frame that's my assumption anyway yeah we'll we'll have to see um jordan do you have anything else to say about op before we answer a couple of mailbag questions and close this bad boy out um nothing pressing i was gonna touch a bit on the judge thing but they also just didn't really have a, a like big information they said there will be some sort of judge program just not at this time um they're focusing yeah. on other stuff and they they don't really need it right now, too, in the short term anyway. So it's, it's totally I, I will fine. say that I find a lot of card game communities very oddly eager for judge programs when they are typically not very necessary for quite a while. Actually, um, they can card games work just fine with a really, really rudimentary judge program until you get to large events where you need people to really understand what's going on. Um, so, yeah, I don't. We, for Star Wars Unlimited too, we saw people like months before the game came out, like, when's the judge program? Like, there's not there's even a game yet. What are you judging? <laughs> As, so I yeah, th- there'll be one at some point for altered too, but uh there's there's no need for anything right away codified again. Like, you know, it's yeah, it'll be okay. Well they'll they'll have it. They'll have it. Um all right. Well, let's uh, let's. Uh, there's a lot of info here, but uh, there's just too much to go through here. Let's let's just get to a few questions here and close out our podcast. The first question is coming from a guy I've never heard of before, Gav Kenny or Gav Ken. <laughs> uh, Gav Ken commented on the last video with another question for you, Dan, to ignore from me. <laughs> I'm not ignoring it. <laughs> you can see it right here. Do you think that a system for evaluating cards power will be created by the community to help evaluate cards, especially uniques? Jordan, what do you think? Let me let me process that. Process. Okay, I'll answer. And Jordan will process. 100%. In fact, I think people are already trying to figure that out. I think we we need to see more uniques to get it down, but this happens in a lot of card games. Um, because a lot of card games are based on a, on a resource system. And the idea is when you spend two resources, you should get something back for it. When you spend three resources, you should get something back for it. And to evaluate cards, we often want to figure out what is one resource worth on a card. And then that allows you, if you can understand this whole system, like, like some people have it like broken down for flesh and blood, they have broken, broken down for, for magic for many, many years. Although these days, magic cards are really wild. So I don't know if it's, they, they need a new system for evaluating them. Um, you know, if you, but when you have it broken down like that, you can look at any new card and be like, yeah, okay. Like you're actually getting more on the card than the resource value is worth, or there's the card isn't delivering as much as the resource value is worth. So it's probably going to be only situational at best. Um, I'd say, if anything, the problem here is that Alter just has a lot of numbers and stuff to tweak going on in the card. So it might be a pretty convoluted um, system for evaluating the power. What do you think, Jordan? Yeah, I think that's the the main reason I got hung up with the questions because there's just so many knobs to turn on all these cards, especially from the one unique we've seen, how drastically different it is from its original like card, but it's still is layered in there and works really well with its original uh, rare and common version. Uh, I feel like it'll be hard to judge sometimes. And some of them are going to seem bad, but then they're going to secretly be good because, you know, depending on the color they're in or what exactly they're doing, or we could have weird cases where one unique is not good. And then one or two cards come out in the next set that pair with it swimmingly. And now all of a sudden it's, you know, awesome card to have in that archetype. So like, it's just, there's so many things to consider. I feel like eventually we'll have some loose form of being like, yo, this unique is pog or this unique is not very good. But 
being the way the game is, it's going to be in flux because at any moment someone else could pull another unique that all of a sudden makes this effect really sick if you get both on board or different things like that. So, I mean, like, you know, like I said, future expansions will change the way you look at certain uniques depending on the card effects and mechanics that are in that set. Yeah, and and I just think like it's a lot easier when a game has a single cost and then you get a single effect for it. But, you know, when you have a cost and then a reserve cost and then that how relevant that reserve cost is, is dependent on the the faction. Sometimes like reserve costs on in Axiom can be can be a totally different ball game than reserve costs in like Bravos because Axiom has tons of ways to like toss stuff into reserve and then use it from reserve or, you know, there's it's I think I think at the end of the day, like there is a system somewhere because when they did the have these uniques coming out, they have some parameters to help them not come out totally busted. Right. So like Equinox themselves has to have some semblance of a system to gauge relative power level of things. Players will easily at some point be able to come up with something as well. How accurate it is, that's going to be another question entirely, I think. So um, yeah, for sure, it'll be it'll be fun to watch. And also games games power creep over time a little bit too so it, the your your system has to adjust with the times as well typically but i think i think people will be eager to come up with one um okay next question uh this is a question from actual days or actual deaths Act- actualities maybe is how i pronounce this <laughs> uh they asked the question what are some abilities you guys would like to see explored and altered? Like being able to put a card from reserve into the mana pool or something, something you guys think would be cool to have in altered. Um, I, I can start off this one because I, I, I need, I'm sure Jordan wants a second to think, but I've thought about this a little bit already. Uh, the, the abilities that I think are really interesting and underexplored from what we've seen right now and beyond the gates are the ones that are looking at the, the uh, region symbols on the board and interacting with those in a particular way. Um, Rin and Orchid, the the leader for Muna, lets you get bonuses when you win on Forest. Um, I like. I think effects like that are really interesting. Ones that you ones that say like you want to win on this faction or on this region type, or this region type doesn't count this turn or you know stuff like that i like i want to see them messing with the region types more even potentially having effects that will just impact what region types you are even standing on you know how like impact the board so like whoops you thought you were fighting for mountain but suddenly mountain doesn't count for you this turn or something um i think that would be a really interesting thing and and that could be used both uh like proactively but also like defensively against the opponent too how about you jordan got anything um, there's two things I think I'd like to see. Um, one thing is I would like to see uh, their take um, on milling. Because in this game, you can't lose the game. So I wonder what kind of cool or interesting mechanical things they could do with milling that could make it a useful thing in the game. Since it takes away the most feel, which I think is the best game to do it in, because it takes away the most feel bad thing about mill decks in every game is... You don't get to play your cards. You just watch as you lose the game from your deck mm. disappearing. But in this game, you don't lose. So they could have an interesting play space by having mill cards do varying things or, you know, activatables that do different stuff related to mill. And that since the the bad feeling is taken away, since you're not going to lose the game from it, it just opens up the space and like playground of like different stuff, like alternative costs, things like that. Um, And then the next thing would be I'm excited for them to open up the space of characters to have varying amounts of reserve and landmark totals because they have the icons on the on the thing. So I'm assuming they're already four, you know, one or two sets ahead thinking about different heroes and champions that have the different uh, lineups on those stat lines, because that would also add some interesting changes to the way you build your deck to the way you're going to play it. It also yeah. technically changes the way some some of the cards are going to be, uh, you know, whether they're more powerful or less powerful, too. Because if you have, for example, a card that scales off of how many landmarks you have, suddenly if there's a hero that can hold four instead of two, that card is now, you know, just went up in stocks because there's someone who can get 
double the effect essentially or you know something like that same with the reserve costs like there's already cards now that benefit from having stuff in reserve or being put in reserve or putting more things in reserve and if you were able to hold more of those in that's just straight extra value on that character yeah 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 for sure i that'll be really interesting too those are those are gonna be interesting knobs to play with because if, you know imagine you have a character that has no reserve but five landmarks or something you know like that's yeah i mean that's that's cool. That that's fun. I'm I actually I really love the crop of characters that we have right now, and I haven't gotten bored of of playing with the different ones on Exalter and everything with half the card pool. Um, but uh, as with every game that is like champion or character based, I'm just I'm pumped to see what other ones are going to come up with too. There's going to be a, a lot of exciting design space to explore. Yeah, and like you just saying, a character with zero reserve, I could see something like that having zero reserve and still just the normal two landmarks, but they have an ability that's like you can pl- play cards out of reserve at minus two cost. So like you're incentivized to play spells, so you can re you know double cast things. Oh, so there's reserve oh, cost is cool. cheap because it can't save for the next turn, but you can cast it once and then cast it again at a cheaper cost, which would be oh that that'd is be an interesting space. <laughs> All right, all right, Equinox. You know, you know where Jordan is. Time to hire him for the, he's got he's got ideas here. Okay, and besides, I need a new podcast co-host, so you should hire him, and then I'll find say where it's two birds with one stone. It's perfect. It's perfect. Um, that's uh, you know, you were also getting me thinking. Like, what about what Jordan? What about this card? I, I just invented this. Okay, this isn't a real card. It's a landmark that says you have plus one reserve. Ooh, so it it, is... it takes up a landmark slot, but it opens a reserve slot. That huh? could be sick. That's kind of like that. that's like, that. like it's just trading a landmark for reserve. That's, that'd be that's kind of interesting. That's interesting ideas. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, we could yeah. we could sit here. We could have an entire episode <laughs> making up cards, and maybe we will at some point when we run out of stuff to talk about. Yeah. Um, but let's do one more question here, and then close things out because I want to go back to one of our older ones to make sure we're getting to our old ones too. Um, Mm -hmm. so this was a question asked to us, uh, on our initial YouTube post calling for mailbag questions from Bronson. Bronson said, I think the print on demand aspect is very interesting and look forward to seeing how it pans out. Me too. Question. If cards can be reprinted at any time from the customer who owns the cards, in theory, this should eliminate the want slash need to grade cards since they can just get them reprinted to a higher grade at any time. If there's no graded market, how does Altered intend to satisfy the high-end collectors who strive to get very rare game pieces due to scarcity of printing variances? Jordan, you've got the answer for this. Let's go. Do I have the answer? I'm just really excited because uh, we have a we have main deck Taylor who hates slabs and graded <laughs> cards. So the, the second he breaker. heard about the print on demand, he was like, "Yes, no one's going to grade anything." Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, but so but, in the absence like said, of grading, though. What yeah, it, in the absence how, of grading, there are going to be those chase cards similar to like the ones we mentioned before and also the Kickstarter stuff, like the special alt arts that you're going to get via, um, you know, tournaments and other special events. Uh, those will now be just the new chase cards. It'll be less important about the, you know, the centering of the card, which in all honesty, I'm kind of with with main deck Taylor on that that set that graded cards are kind of just dumb and kind of a sham. I get that you want to make sure the cards in good condition. But stuff that's beyond your control is just kind of dumb. Like, oh, the printer was literally one pixel to the left. This card's now worth fifty dollars less. Just seemed kind of dumb. Um, but I think I think I like. I've never been one to care about that. I have nothing great. I I have some pretty valuable stuff back here, and I haven't bothered to grade, and I'm not going to. Um, but. I get where people come from because the the perspective is it's very different than a than a game player typically. The idea is that there's a bunch of these cards printed, right? So like let's say you have 100 a, only 100 copies, which is pretty rare of a single card that got printed. And anyone, you know, anyone who picks up one of those 100, that's great. They have they're in the they're in the cool club where they got the rare card. But what's like what if you're not satisfied with having the rare card? What's what's the next thing you can do? Well, I want to have the best copy of the rare card, right? And I think that's where that that's where that kind of comes from. This this desire to be like, okay, well, how can I determine which of these hundred is really 
the white whale, the chase, the the rare one. Well, that's when you start going, well, how are they printed? Like, what's the condition like? Um, that's where that, that stuff kind of comes into play. And, and I will say, I, I mean, I agree. The altered isn't really going to have that. Um, I don't think there's, uh, I don't think currently there's any situation where there's going to be any individual altered card that, um, really needs that could be graded at all. And it would matter. Um, so I think instead if players, if uh, players, I always say players, but if collectors as we're talking about want to get into high end altered collecting, it's going to be more about the, um, the, it will be more about the digital ownership. I mean, they, they'll get, they'll want to get the physical one just to be able to look at, but the true ownership of the collectible will be owning the digital version of it since there's only one of those. Um, and they're going to be chasing down instead of like caring about centering and stuff. They're going to be looking for uniques um, specifically. Mm-hmm. They're going to be looking for like which unique is is the Black Lotus of Altered, which is the iconic, powerful, like clearly the best unique printed. You know, that's which is that's the one the that best. all the others are graded against. Stat-wise. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the that's the closest, I guess, approximation of that kind of like white whale hunting that I can think of in altered. Um, and I, I imagine that'll be, especially if it's the, like you said, the Kickstarter alternate art versions of those cards. If there's like, a, cause those, the kicks, the uniques, they have alternate art, unique versions as well. Those will be the chasest of the chase uniques. And if there's a super powerful version of one of those, like that's the kind of thing that they'll want to hunt down and then get a foiler for and have a foil copy or a hundred for them to look at or whatever. And they can be like, this is my, this binder is all the same card and I'm the only one who owns it that I can see them liking that. Yeah. Or I was the, the other thing I was thinking of is maybe like getting renowned cards. And by that, I mean cards that, you know, people that have won the big tournament, like the world. Oh yeah. Champion wins a game due to this card you know, this specific unique. And then the collector would be like, I want, you know, Jerry Jefferson's unique. Uh, oh, he's a good player. John Day Arc, because that's, by the way, John Jefferson, if there is someone out there who plays Altered, I just threw that name out there. It's, Jer- there, it's Jerry Jefferson. Thank oh, you. Sorry, Jerry, Jerry Jefferson. Jefferson. <laughs> and I could tell he was going to be an artist player name. from the start. I knew he was going to be an artist <laughs> player. But yeah, but like, so that could be another like venue is like because that's what people do in other stuff like sports memorabilia. A baseball is just a baseball until it's the baseball that won the World Series. Then all of a sudden, everyone wants the baseball that was hit that caused the home run to you know that was the ending home run. So like, it'd be something like that. I'd be like, this is the unique that brought Jerry Jefferson the W in the World Championships. I want that one. I got to get Jerry Jefferson as my co-host for this <laughs> podcast, actually. He sounds really good. Dude, I'm imagine t- a, a, imagine the wild world where the first world champion ends up being someone named Jerry Jefferson. Oh, no. Everyone's going to accuse us of, <laughs> of somehow knowing that would happen or, or setting that up or be a bunch of conspiracy theory. Uh, <laughs> that'd be great. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think the other thing, too, is that, like, not every game is for every type of player. Just straight up, uh, you know, I, I get like comments on some of the gameplay videos, too. They're like, this game doesn't look good. Like, OK, like, that's fine. <laughs> I, and I think there will be collectors who um, who just they won't have what they're looking for. They won't want to adapt to caring about digital or caring about um, iconic pieces or caring about the strongest. They, they're just they have they have other card games that they can collect their pieces in. And that's fine, too. For sure, for sure. But uh, is there any uh, any other things you wanted to touch on today, Dan? Nope. Uh, I think I think that'll do it for uh, for us today, Jordan. I like. Oh no, I want to mention. I want to mention. By the way, again. So these we answered a few mailbag questions. Say thank you all so much for submitting mailbag questions. If you submitted a mailbag question, I still have it on the list. Um, it is going to be answered at some point. If you want to provide a mailbag question for us to talk about, we would really appreciate that. We have a lot of fun getting to talk about your questions. Honestly, like we we do our best to come up with interesting topics to talk about, but uh, a lot of the time I enjoy our mailbag conversation more than our main topic. Um, so I love having this and we have, I should keep a count of this. We have, what is it? Eight or nine more, eight, eight more episodes now, I think before Altered launches. Um, well, I guess it would be one more now, given that... <laughs> They, it just got delayed. So 
We need stuff to talk about. So if you want to submit a mailbag question to us to have answered on the podcast uh, as soon as we're able to get to it, you can do so by commenting on YouTube down below with a hashtag Fleeting Thoughts mailbag in your question. That lets me know that you want me to a- answer it on Fleeting Thoughts and not just reply to you in the comments. So really appreciate that. Or you can always email us as well with subject Fleeting Thoughts mailbag at maindeckgames at gmail.com. So thanks so much for everyone providing those um, and keep them coming so that we got lots more questions to answer as the weeks move on as we approach launch. That's the last thing I wanted to say, Jordan. So go ahead. All right. Well, as the day comes to a close, those were our fleeting thoughts. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening. And we look forward to chatting with you in about two weeks. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye.